Hey, thanks for tuning in. Um, so I'm uh, Adam Wangley. I'm a CTF or security lab builder. Um, I work for uh, TryHackMe, but I also build CTFs for uh, myself on ctfchallenge.com, HackerOne. Um, you can check those out as well, see my uh, other work. So this video is gonna be a rundown of my latest challenge for HackerOne, and that one was built to celebrate um, Code Can Care, or Today is New, or Eric, <laughs> however you want to call him, for reaching his milestone of 100K. So it was quite an interesting challenge. We had quite a few solves as well, and people getting stuck on it as well, quite a few times. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna start. <laughs> Okay, how about, uh, how about now? Is that working okay? Yeah, okay, sorry, total noob to this. So uh, it's my first streaming experience over there, bear with me. Okay, so uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the, uh, the CTF challenge. And then, um, so I've got these two terminal windows. So this one is logged into the web server itself. So we can go through um, like the code, find out different things about that. And then this other one, just a temporary box that's spilled up with a couple of tools on there. Um, so the process is gonna be, I'm gonna basically hack through it as I thought people would attempt to. And um, we'll go through some of the rabbit holes and the rick rolls and all sorts of things that were found in there. And also like some of the potential problems as well when you're building a CTF, um, like especially like, things like uh, unintended solves, all the things you've really got to think about when you're putting these things together, especially when they contain the type of vulnerabilities that this uh, challenge does. So let's uh, let's start off. So um, so this, um, you would have started, you got the scope from the Hacker One website, which would be star.ccc.h1ctf.com. So we um, had a totally big scope on there, so you could look for subdomains as well, which we'll, uh, we'll go into in a minute. So firstly, we'll just review this website and see what's on there. So really basic site. It's got a login on there with um, user hash, email, and password, which we'll come back to. And then also a register button, which just takes an email and password in there. So again, pretty standard. Okay, so I think the first thing we'll try and do is uh, we'll just run a FF command against this and just uh, see what we can find on there. Oh, no, we're breaking it already. Let's have a look. Okay, we seem to have some uh, strange errors on there for some reason. Um, let's double check it. Oh, that should be right. Do there we are. Let's just double check that again. Uh, so one of us. Oh, that's the correct one. I'm pretty sure it is. CCH one CCF. Come slash fuzz. Okay. Okay. Then I just wanted to embarrass me for some strange reason. Um, oh, just so you know, I'll keep on having a look at the comments as well. So if you've got any questions at any stage, feel free to put them on there. I think there probably is a tiny bit of like a lag and a delay in this stream. I'm using StreamYard, but I think that just gives you a few seconds delay on there. Uh, but yeah, if you've got a question, 
stick it on there and I'll, uh, I'll answer it and then we'll have a bit of uh, like a Q&A at the end as well if anyone's got any questions. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll just go back to this. Um, also, can everybody see the font size okay on there? Just want to make sure it's not too small and everybody's squinting to actually see what's on the screen. Just uh, give me a shout if there's any issues. So uh, the FF command has uh, come back. We've got some config, we've got images, index.php, login, register, and zip files. So login and register, obviously we've already had a look at that. That's not too interesting. Images, we'll have a look in that, but with it returning a 301, we now have to forbid directory. We've no directory listing in there, so we can see what's going on in there. Uh, zip files was an interesting one, and actually the start of a, uh, not, not quite a rickroll, but a, um, certainly a, like a little daft little head and joke in there. So if we run uh, FF again, and we'll use the zip files directory, at the end of the um, fuzz we'll put .zip, and you know, it's a zip files directory, makes sense to put .zip on the end. So we'll run that. Okay, and we've got users, so that'll be users.zip. So if we run wget https, let's see, zip files, users.zip. So some of you may come across some of these that you've already found them in the challenge yourself. Some of them, it might be new to you, or you might not have even done the challenge whatsoever. So let's grab that, just make sure we've got it. If you zip that. Let's zip that. that revealed a users.txt file. So if we just uh, cap this out. So we've got a bunch of uh, user IDs and a, a very suspicious looking string afterwards. Uh, most of you will recognize the fact that that's an MD5 string. So if we copy this, and if we go to uh, crack station, we it into here. Let's get to uh, delete all these. I'm sure there's a faster way of doing this. Okay, so it's managed to crack all of them and it's come back with maybe well on your side of the screen, which was a uh, something that Eric comes out with quite a bit. Uh, you'll see that on his like, uh, Twitter biography as well. That was something uh, Ben and uh, Hamsek was quite keen uh, to have on there. So uh, yeah, so that's like the, the first one of the kind of the rabbit hole kind of jokes on there. So ditch that off. So if we go back to the uh, FF, I don't think there's anything, oh yeah, there's the uh, config file as well. So this wasn't really of much use to anyone. There was a, a reason I put it in there. And um, so we've just got a, little, uh, a JSON string, a um, bit of information on there, the IP address, the title, of the, the, uh, the site, the domain, um, and this error logging false I just wanted to put that in there, just as a little bit of a clue, a little bit of a hint that there could actually be some kind of uh, like some logs being created in there, um, just just to get you like a little bit suspicious and kind of to help with the next step. So the next thing, let's uh, let's try and register an account. So uh, email address, we'll just put uh, testingtest.com and then password. Okay, so this is what everyone was greeted with. So you just get the your files and then critical remote file list not found. So that, that's kind of telling you that the web server is looking for something external remotely and it's not found it. We've got a critical error and the application just completely stopped at that point. Uh, I think as well, if you inspect as well, it would be a status 500 as well. So, that's, uh, so at, at that point, Quite a few people were kind of scratching their head, not too sure where to progress with that. Um, so, but we put a little hit in here. So website made by CCC Designs, uh, which has a link on there to a Twitter account. So if we open this up, 
So you'll see some things uh, in there, a few garbage messages just to fill it up, make it look like a, a real Twitter account. Um, and then, so there's two quite juicy things in here which were interesting. So the first one, does anyone know if Nginx can link a directory to a proxy pass? So that's something to remember for in a, in a little bit. We'll, we'll come back to that, but definitely a crucial bit of information. Um, and then the uh, the very important one was this screenshot. So um, advertising the fact that they've just finished Coping Care's website um, and put a nice little screenshot on there. Unfortunately, if we uh, have a look at this picture, so let's try and uh, zoom into that as much as we can. Okay, so in the title, you'll see ccch1ctf.com. Error and then underscore hyphen underscore hyphen underscore log dot something. So this again was just like a little clue that I left in there that you know try and follow that, find out what's uh, what's in there. So if we do, uh, if we just open our attack box again. So if we try doing a um, curl request, so HTTPS CTC H1 CTF dot um, error. Um, it's got, I shouldn't have made this so difficult to copy. Log. So this is the point that you had to guess what the file extension would be. So like kind of a, a an obvious one might be dot log. So that one didn't work. Um, that one's not on there. Sure, I've got this right. Okay, so dot tags, really, that's found something. Okay, so here we have some kind of error log. It's saying file, and then we've got a link which actually goes to an S3 bucket for files.xml, not found. So at some stage, the application's been logging, and it's been, um, and it's not found these files, and it's created this error log. Again, that's going back to my uh, config, um, yeah, dot config, where it said error logging now, just to add a bit of kind of rationale to it, to say, right, it was logging at some point, now it's not, so that, that's why you're not going to generate more log files in there. Um, so, so again, okay, so this is the first little fun problem we got into. I didn't register any of these S3 buckets, and I didn't think anyone would bother registering them. I was kind of hoping people would get the clue and move on, but some people decided to register them and put some quite interesting content in there. Uh, a few Rick rolls definitely went in there, and uh, God knows what else. I, I won't be clicking through them today to uh, find out what's in there because somebody's probably put something else in, in again. Um, so the main clue was if you look at the start here, h1 hyphen, and then totally random hash, and then s3.eu, blah, 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 blah. You can read the rest. So each of these are identical apart from this hash in between. So I was hoping this would get people thinking, where have I seen like a similar hash? So if you go back to, I don't know if I can, uh... no, it's not on that. Let me, uh, I'll register a brand new one. That's the best .com. No, password. Okay, yeah. I register that. So when you register an account, you get a unique hash at the end of the URL. And those were the dots I was hoping that people would actually start connecting and see that hash is actually related to this one over here for the S3 bucket. So this application, when it loads up, it's actually loading this external files.xml file. And kind of if you think about maybe the logic of the program, maybe that contains like a list of all the files on there that you're, you've currently stored. It's just like keeping a track and a record of it. So people know, again, that that is an S3 bucket, that hash is, is linking to that S3 bucket. So my idea was hopefully everything will click into place and people thinking, ah, this application, it's loading XML. This must be time for XXE on there. So let's, uh, let's have a look. 
So I've got some, I say some XXC. So I'm not going to show you the process of logging onto S3 and creating your own uh, S3 bucket on there. It, it, it's fairly simple to do. You can do it through the website, upload them, make sure the files are made public. But I, I really can't be bothered trying to like share that on my screen and potentially reveal a load of credentials and my own stuff on that. But you know, you, you get the concept. I think I think one problem that people run into in here is not taking notice of the region of the S3 bucket and people were registering with them in their own regions and that's why they weren't able to progress a little bit. So a few hints maybe went out and then people kind of saw where they were going wrong and registered it in the, uh, the correct place. So in the background, I have registered, so I'll go back, um, I'll just log in. So this is an account I made earlier. So let's, uh, one second, there we go. Fingers crossed that should work. So before I hit login, because that's going to uh, load that remote code, let's have a look at the code that I've actually put on there. So firstly, I'd like to say my original XXC code wasn't as nice as this one. So this was from a uh, write-up from uh, Dexterous and uh, Masoma. So I, uh, I have uh, stole their example and slightly uh, edited it a bit um, for my own use. So if you want to check out their blog post, there's a link on here. If you, you want to check on that, you can either, you'll easily, easily be able to find it on Google or give me a shout and I'll, uh, I'll send it to you. Okay, so the first file is the files.xml. So let's just uh, cut that out. Okay, so we're opening up the XML document. We're loading the uh, external entities. So that is switched on on the system. I'll, I'll go into the web file in a minute and show you how I've actually done that. Um, and then it's it's showing you um, on here, it's saying load this external uh, DTD file, uh, which again is the same hash and the same uh, S3 bucket again. So it'll load this other file. So let me just cut that out. So this one, again, XML, this runs another uh, system command, which actually utilizes PHP filters. So PHP filters is a uh, bunch of inbuilt commands where you can, uh, you can do all sorts of things on it. For this one, it's, um, we're using it to convert uh, certain files to base64. That's because when an XXE, when you send over a file to an external domain, it, it breaks. If you've got a carriage return at the end of that file, it hates it. It really doesn't like it, and it just doesn't send it whatsoever. It's something that a lot of people run into when they're trying to uh, do XXEs successfully. So converting it to Base64 gets rid of all those characters and, and makes it nice. Um, so let's, uh, let's have a look. So what I'll do, I'll just show you the uh, the code before we start. So if any of you do any web development, you're probably going to start noticing a few weird things and naming conventions and totally random things. So I'll come back to that in a second. But this is a very random directory that I've got things in. But there is uh, some kind of method to this badness. So let's go into here and then into controllers and then nano. So yes, nano mapping. It's all right. Okay, so let's show the uh, user information. Okay. So I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you can. So this is the PHP code that is actually loading that remote XML file from the S3 bucket. So you've got the URL, which is, again, the S3 location, h1 hyphen, and then the hash, and then the uh, proper region, and so on, getting that files. So if you, if you wanted to do some XXE stuff yourself, by default, PHP's uh, XML library, it doesn't allow it to work. It will be disabled, so you have to automatically, you have to enable it with these lib XML DTD load. That gives the permissions to say, I'm crazy. I want to load external stuff in here. Let me do it. 
So that's all we're doing basically. We're grabbing that file, loading it into uh, an XML DOM, um, and it's just basically opening it, and that's it. So you, you'll get a choice of error messages. It was this first one, remote list, uh, remote file list not found. That was um, because we didn't have any files on there. The next one was um, invalid XML detected. That's in case people were messing up their XML uh, payload, so they get that error message. And then if the payload is correct, it'll just come up with file list format invalid because I don't expect people to know how this application actually works and how they should have like, done their, uh, their format, their XML, uh, to display things on the site. That wasn't even a feature anyway. There wasn't any point in coding it in. So th that's all that's there. And then the website returns a HTTP status 500, which has some kind of internal errors gone on on the system. And yeah, something's not working right. Okay. So hopefully people have kind of followed what's going on here with the like the XML and the calls on there. So I've slightly edited this. Obviously, the one that's hosted properly has the real IP address in it. Um, so it's going to. Um, so at this point, we could take any file off the system that we wanted. So again, this is going to like fall into some problems. Um, and it's something I've had before with like LFIs, um, where they've included some of my code. And then they've kind of worked backwards from that. They've been able to read my code. Um, and then I use a very, like my own particular framework. It's really kind of easy to use. And it, it just makes really e easy sense to uh, look at it. So you can easily move backwards. And then you'd actually see the source code from a website, which would be a, a massive spoiler, which we don't want. So the first thing I did to protect that. Um, so, sorry, just to backtrack a little bit. That was if people grabbed where they got the resource equals and then the file. If they put index.php in there, that, like I say, would be the root of my framework. And then they could read that code, move backwards, and kind of see all the inner workings, find the flags, game over, uh, unintended. So what we did, if we move back into here, and then we go into uh, public. So we've got index.php and also j3j4hda underscore index.php. So something completely random that uh, yeah, I'd hope that nobody would be able to guess. So if they do happen to steal index.php, so let's just cap out. Okay, we've got secret hash, which people might think, oh, that's, that's something nice, that'd be something juicy. So you may have seen this before. So if we uh, echo this out, and then uh, pipe it to uh, base 64 decode. And then again, we get an MD5 file. So if we jump back to uh, crack station, and then it's resolved it, but it's given us another hash, a strange looking hash. Worryingly, I know what this hash is off the top of my head whenever we see it. I don't actually need to click on it, but if you were to Google it, we've got the good old brick roll, the essential part of a CTF. So again, that was the thing. Probably annoyed a lot of people if they grabbed that file thinking they're onto something good. Apologies for that. How I got that working. So if you're into, uh, like I say, web development, and especially like frameworks and like routing, you'll know that all your web requests, apart from like, like images, JS and whatnot, will actually go through a root file, which uh, with PHP would be index.php. So I had to get around this by if we go into the Nginx settings, like enabled. Again, we've got two on here, so let's go for the random one. So instead of, so the index, basically, so this tells an, uh, Nginx, if you can't find that file, uh, sorry, if there's, um, so if you go straight into a directory, so like ccc.h1ctf.com slash, and that's it. If you don't specify a file, this says, try this file first. 
So again, th this is where I've put my random file. There's no index.php, so it wouldn't load that one. So that, that's how we've managed to get around that first thing. Okay. And then the next thing, of course, so you, you may have spotted this already, a little, little bit of a spoiler for what I've done, is the, um, the file that we're requesting is the etc, uh, etc, nginx, sites enabled, default. So this is going back, if you remember, we had a little bit of a clue about me asking about an nginx issue. Uh, does anyone know if nginx, you can link a directory to a proxy pass? So again, I was like throwing that clue out there thinking, okay, I can grab any file I want on this system. Um, what do I need? How, how do I yeah, carry on with this exploit? And this was my clue to say, right, grab that default file. That's the standard file that you find on like every web server. You could name it something else, like I have done on here, but that's how like the clue that I wanted in there to get them to progress with the challenge. Again, just moving back a step. So if they grabbed that index.php file, um, again, that would have been game over if um, I'd have done it in that way. Instead, we put the nice red roll in there. But you could have built it out manually, and you could have gone to the default location like var, www dot, and then either like HTML, or it might just be in there, or like slash public, things like that. So as I was uh, explaining before, jump systems. That's why I've given it the really random, weird naming convention on there. So nobody will be able to guess that. So they won't be able to work from the root. And, um, oh, sorry, my Sam, I've just seen you. The uh, the thanks.txt, uh, that, that's for you, mate. Um, that's all your uh, payloads. So I'd like to thank you for them. So again, sorry, going back to here. So this is where I wanted to uh, stop people from uh, grabbing the uh, information in there just by going into slash var slash www and working the way through there. Right, so let's hopefully get this exploit to work. So uh, like I said, I went through the XXC before. We know it's gonna grab this etc nginx sites enabled slash default file and it's gonna post it to my system on the file extension and then the that the parameter will be the base64 encoded file. So fingers crossed, live demos never seem to get right. But um let's just listen with netcar on port 80. Hopefully Fingers crossed, if we log into here, it should make the request to the S3 bucket, load the XML, grab the evil.dtd, grab the sites enabled default file, base64 encode it, and then push that to my server. Fingers crossed. Awesome. There we go, we've seen it being pushed. So, pretty lengthy file that we can see here. So let's make sure we grab all of that. So again, so this is a massive base64 file. Let's uh, close that off. So it's finished. And um, so let's echo. Paste that. Uh, this is the uh, and this is the nginx uh, configuration file that I wanted people to get. And here we go, bang in the middle of the screen is the uh, directory linked to a proxy pass, which was the clue from the Twitter account. So we can see that the server uh, internally is running another website on port eight 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 eight. So. I'm sure some people probably tried scanning for that and tried connecting to it. It actually didn't exist. I just built it into my standard application instead. Um, again, I just didn't want to open up another potential vulnerability or something else that could potentially go down if people were absolutely hammering it. Um, so I just try and make it as, as kind of as lightweight as possible. So actually, that's probably a good thing to uh, talk about 
is um, let's just go into here. So each of these uh, logins as well, we have like a data file. So instead of like, if you were to build this application commercially, you'd obviously have some kind of database in the back end here. Um, instead, it's just a bunch of text files. So when you create an account, um, so I'll have a uh, I'm just gonna just move this over here slightly because I think there is some kind of details in there that I don't really want. I'm just gonna delete one of them. Just don't know if confidential going out. Perfect. Let's move that back in. Okay, nice. So yeah, when I'm looking at this data directory, these are all the individual logins um, that were created in there. So like I say, you register an account, creates a text file in here with the hash. Um, it contains, it contains the uh, the hash in there. It contains the token, which um, that's like a like a session ID token for re-authenticating with it. Um, the email address used to uh, log in there, and the password of the user as well. So again, that that was just to totally get rid of any SQL, and make sure that if people were doing like a brute force attack, it wasn't like hogging a load of system resources for people. Nice, clean, easy, lightweight way of uh, handling the logins on there. Okay, so let's just uh, go back to here. So with Base64 decoded, this uh, proxy path, and we can see the location slash, and then we've got another uh, random hash in there. So if we view this on the website, we have the Penga application. Okay, so again, we're greeted with another username and password, Penga network monitor tool, don't get much information on it whatsoever. Um, at, at this stage, there's really hardly anything to get. So I, again, we'll uh, break out FF and see if there's anything to discover on here. Oh, you'll have to remind me as well a little bit just to go through the subdomains as well. We haven't done that. There's uh, nothing good in there, but like, just a, a few little daft things in there. So let's uh, copy that. Make life easier. Uh, FF. Uh, ah, mid directory, didn't it? Um, just if anyone was wondering, this common doc text that um, comes from uh, Daniel's um, set list. So if you search for set list, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows who uh, Daniel is in his uh, amazing word list. So everything that I tend to do, I will use standard dictionaries for. There's absolutely no point in me coming up with some totally random word list that nobody's ever heard of it, it's not fun it's pointless whenever i do brute forcing or directory content i don't want you to spend hours doing it i just want you to be able to understand how to do it and prove that you know how to do it uh, but you know it should never take more than a few minutes if, if it takes more than a few minutes you're doing something wrong or using the wrong uh, list just Go simple, it'll, it'll always work. So let's uh, chuck less in. And then, so, um, like I say, we're using this directory, which is the kind of the fake proxy path to this application. Uh, and then, fills at the end to uh, discover any concept. So, straight away, bank, we've got the dot git, uh, dot git head, and uh, dot git slash uh, config. So, we know there's some kind of git directory on there. Uh, oh, I'm just going back to, uh, I've got a uh, question. Um, let's have a look. Okay, can you show running Nginx configuration regarding the Pinga service? Uh, was it an alias? Uh, yeah, um, let's have a look. It wasn't an alias. Uh, I, I so there's not much to actually show you in the real configuration file. I literally just built it into the framework of the existing website. Um, so if we jump into here, um, go into controllers, 
Um, so you'll see you've got two files in here, website.php and pinger.php. So website.php handles that initial first website that you saw with uh, you know the S3 buckets on that. Pinger.php, this is what handles this website. Um, so uh, again, keeping it easy, keeping it short. Um, I just bundled everything into one application and then I kind of stripped everything back out again to make an individual application for Pinger and hosted that on GitHub, which hence how we've got these .git files in here. So if we, um, let's do a curl request. Config. Okay, so this gives a little bit of information about the GitHub repository that I've discovered. And we can see the URL on here of, uh, of where that's actually hosted. So one cool thing, I suppose if it matched a few more files, there's some tools out there can, that can actually rebuild a GitHub repository uh, if the full repository is on there. I didn't put the full repository on there just so people weren't wasting their time. Um, just uh, there's a few kind of key files. I'll show you how I did it actually. So. Um, into. If anyone's got any questions as well about this framework, um, my framework that I use for all my CTFs is actually available for free on GitHub. If you want to have a nosy at that, use it, change it, fork it, do whatever you want with it, that's, uh, that's absolutely fine. So if we go into the view, and then, so the view file, I, I, if you're used to programming, you'll come across uh, a way of uh, programming, which is MVC, which is uh, Model View Controller. So you've already noticed my controller files. And so th those are kind of things that interact with, uh, like kind of the, the programming, the request that it receives. Then you've got models. And that actually, that's kind of the, the the kind of the brains of the application. That's the things that I like talk to the databases, store information, has kind of strict kind of um, kind of like methods and stuff for each one of the models and then views. That's basically just a bunch of templates. So in here we've got the templates. So if you just go into Git, and you'll see the config.php. Config .php. And you'll notice that is the exact same code as we just pulled from there. Um, I do this by, uh, let's look, let's move back. So uh, part of this application, this framework that I built includes routing as well. Um, so if you have a look in the routing file, so these are all the routes to the application. So you'll see, so any get request to the .git runs the controller Pinger at git folder, or these ones, which is the config description head, goes to the git file. So the, these are the controllers that that root will actually request. So, uh, oops, change that. No. Controller. Uh, Again, so the, uh, the, the doc kit that's viewing that template of the Git folder, which that was just throwing up a uh, 403 forbidden that you can access the, the, uh, the direct listing on there. Um, and then let's have a look. Let's move through here. Should be some other Git files in here. Again, the Git folder one, uh, and then the Git file as well, which opens up those individual templates um, and then uh, sends it to them. I know this is kind of maybe a little bit out of scope for what people were expecting, but if people want to talk to me more about it, then just you know grab me on Twitter, or I'll be happy to do another stream just about the framework if that interests you. Um, right, so let's jump out of here and get back to the hacking. So we've got the, uh, so we've discovered the Git folder with uh, FOF and then we've got this. So let's, oops. So let's uh, copy that. Get rid of that. Okay, and this is the uh, GitHub repo for the uh, Pinger application. So now we've moved on to source code review. 
So this one is about going through the application and finding a potential vulnerability in there. Um, a lot of it, so I'm sure people manually went through the, you know, the db.sql to try and find some like credentials in there. Um, but if you go into the pink code, again, this is my like MVC framework on there. And then, um, let's have a look. Um, oops. Actually, that's uh, so I just go into the index.php. Okay, so this is including all the, so actually this is a little bit different from a normal framework because it doesn't have routing in there. It's kind of stripped back quite a bit, to be honest. Um, so this analyzes the URL that's been grabbed um, by the user and then just directs them to the control that they need to. So the eagle-eyed people will see we've got the API slash ping, which is actually a endpoint on here. So if we run API ping, and we created with a missing query string variable ID. So you know, didn't even make you do a, a, a param mine to find that. So if we stick ID in there, just put it as one. Okay, so we get a result. If we find a matching ID, we'll send we'll send a ping. Pretty useless at this stage. So if we jump back to the GitHub code, we'll actually see where it's going. So we're going to the pinger controller and then the ping method. So let's take a note of this and um, let's see what we can do. So uh, let's look, go to controller and pinger. And there we go, here's the ping part. Okay, so again, so this is looking for the parameter ID see whether that, that's been issued. So that, that, that was here where we did the ID equals one. If it's not, then again, we, we get that missing query string variable, which we just saw before. And then we can have a look into the application a little bit and just see what it does. Um, so this bit of code on here, Actually, I remember it myself now. I've been looking at far too much code recently. Um, okay, so if I file it to this from that address. Um, okay, so this chunk here, this is basically, this was something that I implemented. So each time you make a request on there, it creates a text file with your IP address and the timestamp of made, when you made that request. That was so I could actually limit how many times you were making requests to that service, uh, which we'll go through in a minute just to make sure that wasn't being A, overwhelmed, or it gave you an option to um, get the data out in an unintended fashion. So then, so like, like I say, if, if that's all set up, then we call another method here, which is the ping, and then send, and then it sends your ID to it. So if we jump to that, that's back in the models. So let's just jump back again, models, and then ping. So th this was the bulk of it. This is what like people were kind of stuck on and like, trying to fight with for quite a while. So Looking and reviewing this, you'll see select star from host where ID equals, and then that is the ID that you're passing to it, that get variable. There's no string sanitization on there, so nothing's been filled out of it to actually protect that input. So people doing a source code review should be able to see straight away that that is a potential SQL injection. This is kind of where it got either like, quite complicated because people probably saw that and thought, great, I can harvest information out of it. Um, if you go back to the Penga app and look at db.sql, which is the file which builds the database, you can actually, you've got the whole structure there. You'll see that there's a user table with an ID number, a username and a password. So we know how it's formatted. People would straight away know how to get that information out of there. But this is the issue. So this first bit of code here, if uh, row count equals one, so that's just saying 
if a successful result um, comes back from the database, then continue with this code. Um, so we'll grab the IP, which should be the IP address that's uh, stored in the database, and then the packet size, which is actually cast to an integer. So if you did do some kind of SQL injection and um, you were trying to like put some text in there to be returned, um, it would actually always, so if you put text in there, it would cast it to an integer and it would come out as zero. You will always get a number out of there. And then, so another check on that is that the packet size has to be an integer greater than a zero and less than 65,528 for it to return and, and carry on making these. And then another level is it checks that it is 100% a valid IP address in there. So reviewing that code, you basically, all you can see is whatever you get out of the database and bring into here, it has to be a valid IPv4 address and it has to be an integer for the packet size, which then gets passed to this part. Um, so this is just basically running a system uh, command which calls ping, it sets the packet size that you've um, got from the database. It's got count four, which means it'll send four ping packets and then the IP address that it's going to. Um, the important thing on here that I've actually piped it out to a dev null, which means that runs completely in the background. So um, it won't like kind of uh, return like any information to like the screen or anything if you if you run other things. And also if, if for whatever reason, uh, be, well because the ping command kind of takes about like twenty seconds to run altogether. You you really don't want that kind of like holding the system back. So each time you made that request, you don't want to be sat there for twenty seconds waiting for the page to load. It could potentially crash. Crash could also be a point uh, that people could leverage to actually bring the system down if people were really kind of hammering that endpoint. All the PHP instances would have been uh, used up, and yeah, you uh, would have some problems there. Okay, so if we let's go into the solve part of this then. Okay, let's uh, just close some of these useless tabs down. So I've got some uh, pre-prepared statements on here. So the first thing I advise when people were really stuck on this, um, my advice to them was just get it to send a ping packet to you. Get it to do that first, and then hopefully that would start them thinking of, of what to do. So that, that's what we are going to do first. So on my attack box, I'm just going to run TCP dump. And then, um, so it'll just capture ICMP traffic, probably. Okay, so that's listening for that at the moment. And then we shall add this SQL statement in here. So, uh, ID equals zero. So that's not going to return any results from the actual table. And then we're going to do a union command and then select. So this will actually bring back our own information rather than what's in the table. So uh, we've got an ID of one, um, and then our IP address of the attack box, and then we've set the packet size at 32. So hopefully when we hit that, brilliant. Okay, so that's the four packet. So that's the ICMP request, and then me replying back to it as well. And what you'll notice is the length is actually 40 rather than the 32 that was specified. But that's because there's uh, another um, eight bytes on there for um, for the headers, the ICMP headers. So it always gets extended by uh, eight on top of that, which will be really important for the next parts. Okay, so now we know that we can actually force it to ping our IP address rather than ones that's stored in the system itself. We get stuck on the fact that the only thing we have control of is the IP address, which you know has to be our IP address so we'll receive some communication back, and then an integer. That's the only thing it will reveal to us is integers. So we could actually start working with these queries, and let's, uh, let's load this one. In. So instead of just our normal 32 bytes that we requested before, we're actually going to extend our union a little bit to actually look in the user table 
and get the length of the password. So instead of it returning the, um, the actual password itself, which would obviously be a string, which is not an integer, so it wouldn't continue and send the, thing, the, the, uh, the ping message to us, we're actually getting the length of it instead, which obviously is an integer. So let's, again, send that over. Perfect. So again, we've received those uh, packets and we've got length 29, subtract eight, like I say, for the headers. So we actually know that this password is 21 characters long. Okay. And now, again, a little bit more SQL magic is, okay, we know it's 21 characters long. How can we start getting that information out of there instead? So this is where this next command comes into play. Okay. So, we've got, um, so what it does, we've got the substring command. A substring, that just basically takes a portion of that string out. We can set where it starts and how many characters we actually want to return. So in this instance, we've got the one um, comma one. So that means start at the first position and only return one character. And then what we do is we convert it to the character to its ASCII code. So this will actually give us a numeric identification of what the actual letter is. So again, let's uh, just move this up so it's a bit more clear. Okay, so now we're getting length 93. So again, we need to minus eight from there. And then uh, that will actually give us the first character of, a, of the password when we convert it back again. So to make life easier, what we'll do, we'll just close this TCP out, clear that off. So I uh, was going through TCP dump uh, a couple of days ago, just uh, not working out like what would be the best commands from there. So what we've got is TCP dump, it just, all it's after is one packet and um, the type of packet we want it has to equal an IC, ICMP packet, uh, and I'm sorry, an ICMP echo uh, packet. So that, that's the actual request of it coming to our server rather than our reply back to it. And then with orc, it strips that out, that TCP dump, like the line that would come out. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly run that because that'll uh, make a little bit more sense. Okay, so let's grab that one packet and we get that length at the end. So then we'll pipe it to uh, orc and it'll look for the 14th um, like variable that's being passed back. So all of these things are sp they're split up by a space. So the, the 14th one is actually the length at the end, which um, is in this instance 93. We deduct eight from it. And then we print out the string using uh, printf, so we'll say received, and then it'll actually cast the integer back into a character again. So let's do that. And I imagine, is it going to give me an error? Yeah, too many requests. So what I'll quickly do, um, so this is what you guys have to unfortunately put up with, but it's something I can cheat on and get rid of. Yeah, let's have a look. So yeah, this here is checking whether we've talked to it in the last 60 seconds. And if we haven't, then it goes on and runs the code. Otherwise, you know, you get that too many requests from your IP. So we can actually edit this. Let's just try and check true. So if true, which always returns. So does it. And there we go, received you. So we, we get the first character of that password. So then we can rerun that command again. Keep going. And then uh, on the SQL statement, we can actually now move on to the second character. So again, so, and then we know the next uh, character of the password is D. So unfortunately, you guys had to wait a minute in between these. So a minute, there's 21, so that's 21 minutes. We won't go through that pain. But I did work up a little bit of um, bash magic before. So 
let's have a look at this. It's quite an interesting command to kind of automate this. Let's just declare that off. So we're doing a loop for, uh, so I'll cast a variable. Um, so sorry, it, it starts a for loop, which runs 21 times. And each time it, can, it casts the i variable to the current loop that's on. So like I, at first, like the first time around, it'll equal one, then two, then three, and then four, and so on to 21. So then the next command is a curl command. Which then goes to um, so that runs the ping um, API endpoint with the union, and then you'll see the I here. So that pass, that's uh, again the one two three four five. So it kind of iterates through there. It runs straight after that. It runs TC, uh, TCP dump, then um, looking for those ICMP echo packets, then again to ORC, but this time it builds a command into it as well, where it echoes that result out into a password file. Then it sleeps for five seconds, just so we don't duplicate any of those. Like if we run it too fast, it might pick up an ICMP packet from the previous request. So I've just got to sleep for five seconds. So let's keep that going. So as you'll see, it's made the request. <clears throat> That's the, uh, if we find a matching ID, so we know if it's working, it's grabbed a packet, and then it's like it's switched off and we're, we're in this loop of 21 times. So actually, while that's running, this might be a good time to go through the other SSL certificates. So great resource, SRTSH. So this is actually built into a lot of uh, reconsoles. Uh, so SRT.SH keeps a public record any time a SSL certificate is registered. So whatever wacky name you give to an SSL certificate, uh, like any subdomain thinking, you know, security through obscurity, nobody will ever guess this, it gets registered in the public, people will find it. So yeah, uh, CRT.SH, you can just bang in any domain name you want. So this instance ours, and then you know, we've got these records. So we've got uh, 900,000, uh, which is the German for 100,000. Again, going back to the 100K play for uh, for Eric's CTF. And uh, then uh, Santa Mila, uh, which is uh, the Italian again for 100,000. So each of these, if you were to request them and go on the website, they didn't do much whatsoever. They just redirected straight the website but it was giving you a clue so we've we've covered two languages on there but maybe there'd be a third so we're thinking what well, what could we do eric lives in uh oops, sorry. eric lives in canada so you know let's go for french so you know, what's the french for 100 000. There we go. So I'm not too sure if this worked in the request. Let's have a look. So as you'll know, so we didn't actually register an SSL certificate. So we thought maybe some people will do some like uh, subdomain enumeration, see that and then think, oh, well, there might not be a HTTPS certificate, but there might be a HTTP. Okay, so we get an error message there just saying that connection is private. Oh, I think it's need some annoying Google thing. Okay, that's fine. What we can do. Ah, this is finished actually. So we'll do it in a curl command instead. Oops. So it's not HTTPS, it was HTTP. And again, we get another base64. Let's copy that. But this is uh, quite a good one. I don't know if I quite like this one. Uh, you will actually find this all over the internet. So Eric's quite famous for his subdomain takeovers. Um, and when he does one, he leaves this message, today's new subdomain takeover. So you, if you, if you, even if you just, oh, we'll see actually, let's just, just Google that. 
and you'll see a load of references back to Eric. You'll also find loads of subdomains on there, which have been listed uh, as well with that. So that was a little uh, like, uh, nod to uh, Eric's work on uh, subdomain takeover. So if we go back to here, we know the uh, script has finished now, and it's echoed it out to the uh, password.txt. So cat password.txt. Okay, so that should be the whole file. Uh, so fingers crossed it's got it properly. I'll put admin, I'll put the password in. Brilliant. And there we go. Then this was the end of the CTF, and that's where people got their last flag that they could submit. And um, just telling people to make sure they submit the flag to the Hacker 101 and uh, write the report up for Hacker 1. That is basically the end of it. That's um, that, that's how he solved it. I think we've gone through, yeah, I think we've gone through all the rabbit holes in there and the potential pitfalls on the system as well and what kind of things we, we've we done to avoid any, um, any unintended solves on there as well. So I don't know at this stage if anyone's got any questions. If uh, anyone wants to put any questions in the chat, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, I don't think anything's coming through at the moment, but um, ah. thank you. Thanks for the, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, I, uh, I was trying to get a bit more adventurous with my uh, SQL injections and, uh, and give people a bit of a challenge. So cool. No, if, if, if nobody's got uh, any questions, that's absolutely cool. If you think of something, um, I absolutely love talking about this stuff. Um, hit me up on Twitter or Discord or wherever um, and ask me some questions. I'll be happy to chat about it or uh, anything else security related. But um, again, thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. It's just been over an hour. Hope it hasn't been too boring. It's my first stream, so it's a bit panicky and hope it's not too rushed. If anyone wants to give me any feedback for my streaming, That'll be more than welcome as well. I'd, uh, I'd like to hear that. But uh, yeah, apart from that, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, again, yeah. So yeah, thank you. If you want to, um, if you want to get in contact with me, um, best place is Twitter, Adam T Langley. Uh, I've got some of my own challenges on ctfchallenge.com. Quite a few of these challenges end up on Hacker One Hundred and One. My recent one was the APR, the RTFM uh, one. Hacker One again, um, they um, for the past kind of year and a half, they've been choosing me to bring these uh, CTFs to you. So it's a uh, love working with them. And uh, Try Hack Me is where I, that's my day to day, uh, where I'm a content engineer and build challenges. So have a look on there, dig out some of my challenges and the content on there, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. It's very much kind of web focused on there. Um, so yeah, again, thank you very much for tuning in, and I'll uh, speak to you all soon. Thank you.